I would encourage you, if you would, go ahead and open in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians. We're continuing in our studies through 2 Thessalonians. We're still in chapter 1. This morning we're going to be looking at a few verses there as we hopefully will complete the chapter. We'll see how it goes. You know, it's not long as we enter into this letter of Paul's to the church at Thessalonica, this second letter, it's not long until we enter into this letter that we're met with uh, some challenges. I believe this letter offers many challenges, and, and I, I think one of the things it's, it does is it, it challenges us in some ways as to how we understand what we understand about following Jesus. Chapter 2 may challenge our understanding and, and expectations of end time. Who is the person of lawlessness? In our text today, in chapter 1 and verses 5 through 12, we're challenged through the words of the Apostle Paul to consider justice. And how does that relate to following Jesus? How does that relate to following Christ? This letter, although it's, it's short, I think it provides a lot of challenges for us. A lot of things for us to consider as we dwell upon the words that are penned and consider them for our lives today. But as we wade through this text together, one of the things that I want to remind us of, and one of the things I want us to keep in mind, is Paul's purpose for writing this letter. Paul's purpose for writing is to comfort and to reassure Christians who are in Thessalonica. He also addresses those who are idle later in the, in the letter, But the primary purpose that Paul is writing this letter for is for comfort and reassurance about the trials and the things that they are going through and that they are experiencing for following Jesus. And as we read through this letter, we're going to be challenged by some things. But I want us to remember, as we're challenged, remember Paul is is writing to encourage He's writing to reassure. He's not writing this letter so that we go home with thousands of questions about our faith and about Jesus and about the end times. That's not Paul's intent. Paul's intent is to reassure and to comfort believers. So I just want us to keep that in mind as we kind of walk through this text together. And last week we talked about how this, this letter can be uh, really outlined pretty pretty easily. You can see the main movements in this letter pretty, pretty easily. Paul begins with a series of thanksgivings in chapter 1 and verses 1 through 12. Uh, he's going to address some misunderstandings in chapter 2, and that's misunderstandings about the day of the Lord. That's primarily chapter 2 and chapter 3, the address to those who are idle which may be because of their misunderstandings about the day of the Lord. But we didn't talk about this last week, but I want to bring it up this week because we're going to dwell on Paul's prayer here in chapter 1. But each of these three movements are marked by a prayer that comes at the end of the movement. So if you just notice in your text, for example... There, at the end of chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, Paul prays for the church. That Christ is glorified in you. As we move through chapter 2, in verses 16 and 17, Paul's prayer is that the Lord give them encouragement and strength. And then in chapter 3, as that movement draws to a close, Paul prays that the Lord of peace would grant them peace. And so this morning, as we begin our conversation here of chapter 1 and just kind of looking at some things that Paul is sharing with the church, I want to start at the end. 
I was thinking about Dr. Stephen Covey all week as I was writing this because one of his seven habits stuck in my brain from 30 years ago is, you know, begin with the end in mind. <laughs> okay, you don't understand. Anyway, but that's one of the seven habits of highly effective people, in case you don't know. Begin with the end in mind. Uh, so I want to go to the end. I want to go to the prayer. I want to look at the prayer. I want to read it, and I want to understand, because here's what I think is happening. Paul is driving to this point in this first movement. And maybe if we see where, where he's going in the text, what he's driving to, it will help us better go back and understand what he's writing. So that's, that's my purpose for beginning at the end. Let's drop down 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 11 and 12. And let's read his prayer together. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of His calling and that by His power He may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as we begin at the end, Paul's desire is that they, the Christians in Thessalonica, are worthy of the calling of Christ. Paul desires that they are worthy of the calling of Christ. He, he desires them for, to, uh, to strive for goodness that's prompted by their faith, by their trust and their belief in Jesus, their faith in Christ. And Paul desires this. Why does he desire this? Why does he want this? So that the Lord Jesus is held in honor and in the highest praise among the people and among the church. So that Christ is glorified. You see, Paul desires this for the church because he desires for Christ to be glorified in them and through them. This is the challenge that Paul is bringing. What you're experiencing, the suffering that you're going through, the trials that you're facing, Paul's desire is even in this, Christ be glorified. And this church is facing persecution. They're facing suffering. They're facing trials. They're facing these trials because they follow the teaching of Christ. I'm way ahead of my notes. I apologize. But they're facing these trials because they're taking on the name of Christ, because they're following the teaching of Christ. And Paul says, even in this, I want Christ glorified in you. That's what I want to see. And this is a high calling. It's a high calling. Think about your lives. Think about where you are. Think about the trials you go through. Think about the tr troubles you face. And Paul says, you know my desire? That Christ be glorified in you. Even in the trials. It's a high calling from an apostle who knew what glorifying Christ meant amid suffering and trials. Paul knows what he's praying for as he asks that Christ be glorified in this church. So let's back up for a moment and let's unpack what Paul is sharing and how is Christ glorified in the context here of these Thessalonian Christians and what they were experiencing and what they were going through in their life. Let's back up to uh, chapter 1 and verses 5 as we begin reading verses 5 through 10. All this is evident that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. 
You need to underline that. Mark that in your Bible. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who have troubled you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with an everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might on the day that He comes to be glorified in His holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you. He's writing to the church. This includes you because you have believed our testimony to you. So again, notice the church is suffering because they're following the gospel of Christ. They're following the message, the testimony of Jesus Christ that Paul has brought to them, and they're following the teachings of Christ. And for following the teaching and the way of Christ, some of their neighbors are causing them trouble. Some of their neighbors are persecuting them abusing them because they follow Christ. Now listen, there is a suffering that's common to us all as people. There's going to be trials that no matter what, we each experience and are going to go through. Paul is not talking about those types of trials that are common to all of us. He's not talking about that type of suffering that's common to all of mankind. He's talking about a persecution and a suffering for the specific reason of, of, of following Christ and naming Him as King of our lives. That's the persecution that this church has fallen under. Because they claim Jesus as King, their neighbors are persecuting them. Because they take the name of Christ, they're following, under, they're following under persecution. And what does Paul say? Even amid that, my prayer is Christ is glorified. Amid the suffering and the pain that you're experiencing, Christ is to be glorified. Now notice what Paul is not doing. Paul is not encouraging violence. Be careful here. Paul is not encouraging revenge. He's not encouraging retribution. Just the opposite. What he's encouraging is for Christians to follow in the manner of Christ, and to follow the instruction of Jesus. Today in our culture, in our time, it's easy for us to get incited to anger, emotional anger, or even outbursts. We have so much division in our culture and in our world, politically, socially, we can't even talk to one another anymore. Before we seek to even understand where someone may be coming from, we've drawn battle lines and we're ready to defend our position at all costs. What would it mean for us to glorify Christ in our lives and in our culture today? What do you think Paul would write to the church at South Belt? You see, the words of Jesus, they transform lives. Transform communities. In Matthew's gospel is a section of, of teachings of Jesus that Matthew has shared with us 
Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And we refer to this collection of teachings often as the Sermon on the Mount. I can't tell you how important (laughs) these three chapters have become to my life. And these teachings have challenged lives and generations and people for many, many years. People like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who dwelt on the Sermon on the Mount and it shaped a movement. A young woman by the name of Corey Tin Boom who, who focused on the Sermon on the Mount and allowed her to forgive her worst enemies. A man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German who was educated in America, went back to his homeland to save countless numbers and who gave his life, all shaped by dwelling on the words of Jesus found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You see, contained in Jesus' words is a different way of living. His words, it's a different way of understanding ourselves. It's a different way of understanding the world that we live in. And I believe, at least in part, it's what Jesus understood as God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Let's look for a moment at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 38 through 42. Jesus taught, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And then if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. That's a reference to the Roman soldiers. They had the right to demand you carry their pack for one mile. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Where do you think Paul got his ideas from that he's sharing with the church in 2 Thessalonians? Paul's life was shaped by the words and the teachings of Jesus. What would it mean for our lives if we truly were to dwell on the words of Jesus? In challenging the Christians at Thessalonica, Paul encourages them He challenges them to rely on the Lord's justice. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and beginning in verse 6. Paul says that God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. I think all of us, I certainly hope all of us, have a desire for justice. When we see evil, when we see abuse, when we see injustice, I think each of us have a a desire for things to be made right. I certainly hope you do. I don't know any of us who likes to see injustice not made right. But see, what Paul is instructing this church is is to rely on the Lord's justice. Judgment and justice will ultimately be in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in Him things will be made right. But to follow Jesus does not mean that we allow revenge, retribution, retaliation, or as in the words of the Apostle Peter, Repaying evil with evil, following Jesus means that we don't allow these things the opportunity to overtake our lives. 
following Jesus ultimately means that I'm relying on His justice and I'm not taking matters into my own hands. I'm not seeking my retaliation or revenge. Notice as Paul continues in verse 8, He will punish those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with an everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might on the day that He comes to be glorified in His holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. See, Paul reminds the church that persecution, the injustice that they are experiencing, the suffering that they are going through is not going to be forever. Jesus will return. And He will bring justice with Him on the day He comes. Paul says more, he says even more, those that have rejected this good news, this gospel of Jesus, they're going to be shut out from the presence of the Lord. And for the Apostle Paul, I think this is is the ultimate tragedy to be outside of the presence of God, the presence of the Lord. I want to share with you some words from uh, somewhat of a commentary from the Bible Project as they noted on these passages. They say, and I quote, Paul doesn't speculate on the fate of those who reject Jesus except to say that throughout their lives they wanted nothing to do with Jesus and in the end they get what they want, relational distance from their Creator and King. For Paul, this is the ultimate tragedy to choose separation from Jesus, who is the source of all love and life, is to embrace one's own undoing. Now, as we consider this text today, for me, I don't know about for you, but I find it very challenging. How does this relate to our lives today? Does it relate to our lives at all today? Let's come back to Paul's prayer for a minute. In verse 12, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. According to the grace of our Lord God, Lord of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul desires for the Lord to be glorified in their lives. Paul desires that they walk worthy of their calling, that they strive for goodness that's prompted by their trust and faith in Jesus. Following Jesus, it's going to be different. It's going to be different than what we see patterned so often around us. Because following Jesus has the power to transform lives. Following Jesus has the power to transform communities. His words are going to challenge us to envision a different way of living and of understanding both ourselves and the world that we live in. Following Jesus means that He will be glorified in our lives.